turn with me to Philippians chapter one, and I kind of just want to expound upon why I feel the Lord has given me this specific verse to set the tone for our weekend coming up. Has anybody been following American Idol? Oh man, okay, who do you, who do you, who do you wanna win? Oh, who, who, uh, who um, the dork? Fritz, yeah, get out of here, Fritz. No, I'm kidding. All right, it's all about Noah, guys, am I right? Does anybody know, you know, for those of you who aren't following American Idol, it's, it's, been, a good, it's been a good year. It's been a good season. Um, I voted for Noah. Um, I exceeded my texting limit. So, I mean, they only give you 10, and it's free. So I voted for him 11 times, and I think that's what did the difference. All right, you ready for me to stop being weird and read scripture? Um, let's pray. You guys doing okay? You guys doing good? I'm so, I'm so glad you're here tonight. Um, we're going to pray and then let's get started. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for my brothers and sisters here tonight. I pray that you would open up our hearts to hear from you, Lord. Pray if anyone had a bad day today, that you'd encourage them and that you'd comfort them. Pray that if anyone had a good day today, that you would have them find their joy in you. Thank you for meeting us tonight. We thank you for your word, which is timeless truth. We pray for our conference this weekend. Pray that you would do a great work in our hearts, Lord. Pray that you would help us to have fun meeting new people, hearing from Pastor John, that you would do such a good work in our lives by your Holy Spirit, that we would leave the conference different people, more committed to following you. And I pray that tonight we would lay the groundwork, Lord, to get us excited for what you're gonna do this weekend. Um, so God, we love you. We thank you for first loving us. And now we commit our Bible study to you. I pray that you would teach that anything dumb I say, which is, you know, might be 90% of what comes out of my mouth, uh, would go in one ear and out the other but that everything from you, Lord, would stick permanently. We love you, Lord, and we pray all these things in your son's name. And everybody said, amen. Um, there's a, a country song by a man named Jaron Lowenstein. And uh, the song is called Pray For You. And he wrote the song after he went through a really rough breakup with his girlfriend. Uh, it's kind of like a bitter breakup. Anybody kind of been through there? Maybe you're in the middle of that right now and, and it's awkward um, and you feel uncomfortable as I say that. Um, and so he wrote this song called Pray For You, but he, he had a little bit of an interesting twist on, on what prayer is. So here's, here's how the lyrics go. He says, I haven't been to church since I don't remember when. Things were going great till they fell apart again. So I listened to the preacher as he told me what to do. He said, you can't go hating others who have done wrong to you. Sometimes we get angry, but we must not condemn. Let the good Lord do his job and you just pray for them. And so the chorus goes like this. I pray, he says, your brakes go out running down a hill. I pray a flower pot falls from a windowsill and knocks you in the head like I'd like to. I pray your birthday comes and nobody calls. I pray you're flying high when your engine stalls. I pray all your dreams never come true. Just know wherever you are, honey, I pray for you. <laughs> Isn't that messed up? But those of you going through a rough breakup, you're like, I'm going home tonight, I'm playing that song, and I'm, that's what my prayer life's gonna look like tonight. Um, Paul here, or P, uh, yeah, this Paul, he wrote Philippians, and he, he tells the Philippian church that he's praying for them. But his, his prayer's a little bit, a little bit better than uh, old country guy uh, Jaron writes to, about his ex-girlfriend. And so we're gonna read um, 
we're gonna read Paul's prayer and we're gonna read all about what Paul is praying for this church. And so Philippians chapter one, start in verse one, we're gonna read the first 11 verses together. And I usually teach and read out of the New King James Version, but I really like how the NLT, the New Living Translation writes this. So that's the translation I'm reading from tonight. Philippians one, Uh, Chapter one, verse one, it says, this letter is from Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. I am writing to all of God's holy people in Philippi who belong to Christ Jesus, including the church leaders and deacons. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. He says, every time I think of you, and kind of, you know, this kind of sounds like an ancient country song, you know? Every time I think of you. So, you know, I, I could go on, but you would just, you would want to pay me money um, because I'm just that good. So I won't do that. Every time I think of you, girl, that's what Paul says. Every time I think of you, okay, verse three, every time I think of you, so this kind of sounds like a country song here, but it's, he, he's talking to them uh, affectionately. He's, he's, he's telling them what he, what he thinks about them and, and how he, he's going to be praying for them. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. So guys, if you're having like relationship troubles, you just start, just write out Philippians chapter one. It might go well for you. Every time I think of you, girl, I give thanks to my God. (laughs) Whenever I pray, I make requests for all of you with joy, girl. Okay, we're gonna gonna get back to the text. Verse four, "Whenever, whenever I pray, I make my requests for all of you with joy. This room is so uncomfortable right now. For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. Uh, Verse six, he says, and I am certain that God who began the good, I'm sorry, I just keep thinking of this as like a a crush note that you write to your, you know, your significant other. I'm sorry. Verse six, and I am certain that God who began the good work within you. I'm so sorry, guys. I've, I've got like, I'm like, I'm so like giddy right now. And uh, I'm married and I should have used these verses. Okay. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I just pray that you would uh, just thank you for the gift of laughter. Um, I don't know what's in this water, but uh, Just thank you for bringing us here. Okay, in Jesus' name, amen. Verse six, he says, thank you, thank you guys, thank you. Okay, I'm ready, I'm ready. Verse six, and I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it's finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So it's right that I should feel as I do about all of you, for you have a special place in my heart. You see how just affectionate Paul's words are here for this church in Philippi. He goes on to say, you share with me the special favor of God, both in my imprisonment and in defending and confirming the truth of the good news. So Paul is writing from prison here. He says, verse eight, God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Christ Jesus. Verse nine, we're gonna gonna really focus in on, on verses nine and 10. I pray that your love will overflow more and more, and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. Here's our verse. For I want you to understand what really matters, so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ, for this will bring much glory and praise to God. So here's what he prays. He tells the Philippian church, again, he writes very affectionately towards them. He's been, he says, I've been thinking about you. He says, I thank God for you. He says, I, I, I pray for you. And this is what he prays in verses nine and 10. But first, for now, just verse nine, he says, and this I pray. So this is his prayer for the Philippian church. He says, this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. He says, I pray that you might be overflowing with love. Listen, as believers in Jesus Christ, the one thing that must characterize and identify us as believers is one word, it's the word love. 
In John chapter 13, verse 35, Jesus wrote to his disciples. He says, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you also must love one another. And by this, okay, by what? By, by your love, by this, everyone will know that you are my, my disciples if you love one another, he says. So love is the very thing that characterizes us as believers. People will know that you are a disciple, a follower of Jesus, if you love people. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, Paul says, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is what? Love. So as believers in Jesus Christ, we're identified by our love. That's what Jesus said, that's what Paul says. D.L. Moody, he's a great theologian. He has so many great quotes. One of the quotes I love is, he said, a man can be a good doctor without loving his patients, or a good lawyer without loving his clients, or a good geologist without loving rocks or science, but a man cannot be a good Christian without love. So going back to verse nine, Paul prays here, he says, I pray this, this is what I pray, that your love may abound, or other translations say that your love would be overflowing. He says, I pray that your love would abound still more and more. But notice with me, okay, yes, as disciples, as believers in Jesus Christ, love is supposed to characterize us. Love is supposed to be the thing that identifies us as followers of Jesus. But notice when Paul says, this is what I pray for you, that your love may abound still more and more. Notice he doesn't put the period there. He doesn't finish that sentence. Here's how he finishes it. This I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and discernment. Paul is qualifying what overflowing love is supposed to look like in the life of the believer, saying that the parameters in our love are knowledge and discernment. Knowledge and discernment. Secular's, secular society, their motto is love is love, right? Everybody in this room has heard that. Love is love. In essence, there are no parameters to love. Whatever you love is safe, healthy, beneficial, and right. Tolerate everything, accept everything, and that's what true love is. And Paul is saying, no, 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 no. The overflowing love that I am speaking about to one another needs banks, just as a river has banks. And one bank is called knowledge, and the other bank is called discernment. And your love needs to flow within those banks to be safe. Okay, overflowing water sounds awesome until there are no parameters within that river. A river that has no banks or parameters causes destruction and can kill people. That's, that's, that's how there are floods, when water flows outside of the set borders and parameters. So if water has free flow without any direction or discretion, it can actually harm and kill people. So love, Okay, so love, if it is not guided by biblical understanding and biblical discernment, can be unsafe and harmful. Here's a silly example. I have an overflowing love for vanilla uh, cream donuts from Dunkin' Donuts. I have an overflowing love for vanilla cream donuts. Now, is loving Vanilla cream donuts, is that wrong? No, it's a beautiful thing. It's awesome. And after young adults, go over to Dunkin' Donuts and just buy a dozen of vanilla cream donuts and your night will be that much better. So loving vanilla cream donuts, is that wrong? No, but it can become wrong if my overflowing love for vanilla cream donuts has no parameters to where then I'm just indulging in this and that can do me actually harm in the long term. Tooth decay, heart failure, 
diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. You know, too much sugar intake can lead to harmful consequences. So if love for something or someone is not functioning or operating within proper uh, parameters, that love can actually be damaging. Okay, on a more serious note, sex is a beautiful thing. One can love sex, God created and designed sex, but one's love for sex must be enjoyed within the biblical parameters of understanding and discernment, and those parameters are that sex is to be enjoyed within the context of a marriage between one man and one woman. That's what the Bible says, and when you love and enjoy sex within those parameters, it's a beautiful, wonderful thing. It's a God-honoring thing. But when one loves sex outside of their God-given parameters, then sex can actually be a very harmful thing, very painful thing, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. It can do a lot of damage. And so, Sometimes something in and of itself isn't wrong and loving something or someone isn't necessarily wrong, but the term love is love that our society loves to use, where it's just whatever you love or feel like doing, that, that's good for you? No, that's, that's, that's not. Actually, it can be unhealthy. And so Paul here, he says, this is, this is what I pray for you, that your love would abound. Because love is what identifies us as followers of Jesus. And you cannot be a good Christian without love. So love has to be the very thing that identifies us as believers in Jesus Christ. But, Paul says, I pray that your love may abound more and more in what? In the parameters of knowledge and understanding. Because it's important that we use God's word as the parameters to help us understand how to truly love people and what true love in our world and in our culture and in a relationship actually looks like. And so, this is what Paul prays. He says, I pray that your love would abound more and more in biblical knowledge and, and understanding. And, and here's why, here's the whole point. And he's building this up to, to eventually get to verse 10. So. Again, he says, this, this is what I pray, that you would overflow in love, in knowledge and all discernment. Why? Verse 10. For, or, or so that, for I want you to understand what really matters. I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. What Paul is saying is, basically, guys, love is awesome, but I want your love to be directed by truth so that you can understand what really matters in life. Because when love is unguided, at best it's unproductive, at worst it's destructive. When love is unguided, you just, whatever you're attracted to or whatever you desire, whatever you love, you go after. When love is unguided, at best, it's just unproductive, it's just meaningless, and at worst, it's, it's actually destructive. So Paul, what he's communicating here to this church, whom he deeply loves, these aren't words of like condemnation or like, I don't want you to have any fun, you're a Christian, you got all these rules now, right? He says, no, guys, I love you. So he says in the verses leading up to this instruction, he says, guys, I love you so much. I think about you all the time. He's so using like romantic words here. Guys, I think about you. I love you. I pray all the time for you. This is what I pray. I pray that your love would be overflowing in knowledge and understanding so that you can understand what really matters. Unguided love can lead to loving all sorts of things. And just for fun, I made a list. Here's, here's like a lot of things that we love, and these things aren't wrong. These things aren't bad. Okay, this is just kind of unguided love. Xbox, shopping. Who loves, who loves video games? Okay, just say it, just say it. Okay, you love it. 
Shopping, we love shopping. Okay, some of you are lying. You're like, I don't know if I should raise my hand for this list. All right, I love job security. I love a paycheck, that's great. I love clothes. That's right, that's, right, right. that's kind of a given, right? Pets, some of you love sports. The Washington Commanders, the Washington Redskins, let's just say it. Let's just say that, okay. I love hiking, food, Chipotle. All right, I love TV, movies. Taco Bell's $5 box. I actually haven't had that in like a long time, but as I started like creating this list, I was like, these are some of the things I love. Do they not even do that deal anymore? Is that not, doesn't exist? Forget it, scratch it off the list. All right, the beach, exercise, relationships. We love knowing what our relationship status is. Now, is loving all of these things wrong? No, it's not, it's not wrong. Okay, loving these things isn't wrong. Are any of these things wrong? No, are, are these things unimportant? No, I mean, maybe some, yeah, but, okay, physical exercise, no, that's important. All right, Chipotle, certainly, that's important. Sports, I mean, these, these, like some of these things are like a paycheck, that's important. No, so I'm not making the argument that like just loving a lot of things in life is, is wrong and uh, that we just have to like only love our Bibles and only love the Lord. Now, that is a different kind of love. I hope you love your Bible more than you love Taco Bell's $5 box. But loving these things, is it wrong? No, loving these things is, are these things unimportant? No, but okay, I wanted you to be honest. At the end of the day, it's great that we're, like, we can have fun and laugh and I love having fun with you guys. At the end of the day, do these things really matter? Some of you are like, yeah, I mean, <laughs> some of this like really matters. Okay, if, if, okay, I'm just totally being honest with you. If you go through this list, or this was just a fun list I put together, you make your own list. If you go through your list and you actually say that, like tell yourself that these things really, really matter, that's very, very dangerous. Paul says, this is what I pray for you guys. I love you, I care about you. I pray that your love abounds more and more. I pray that your love is overflowing in the parameters of what true love actually is and the parameters of understanding and discernment so that for the whole point, for the whole reason, I'll go back to verse 10, for the whole point that, that I want you to understand what really matters. So, does, does like this list, does this list really matter? Does your list really matter? Of like all the fun things that we love in life? No, but like let me be totally honest with you. This list, like paycheck, job, relationship, status, sports, food, all the stuff, this is the stuff we spend 95% of our day thinking about. So we would, all, we would all like admit like, no, these things are silly. I mean, yeah, it's, it's important. Some of the stuff's important. Some of the stuff I just love. I love video games, love. But we would admit, like, this list, like, it, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter because I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. These things don't really matter. But we are fooling ourselves because this list is exactly what we spend our time thinking about the whole day. What am I going to eat? What am I going to wear? How's my day going to go at work? Am I going to have job security, the next paycheck, my relationship status? We actually spend 99% of our day, our health, our physical exercise, we spend our whole day thinking about these things that we would kind of humorously admit, these things don't really matter. So Paul says, I pray that your love overflows in knowledge and discernment so that you understand what really matters. So that you understand what really matters. Because here's the whole end goal. Abound in love, in discernment and knowledge, so that you understand what really matters. Why? So that you can live pure and blameless. So that you can live pure and blameless lives. Is that list of things bad? No. Am I saying you can't enjoy those things? No. Enjoy those things. But do these things lead to the end goal of the Christian life, which is purity and a clear conscience before the Lord? No. Those things don't lead to purity before the Lord. Those things are fun, those things can be enjoyed, 
Those things can be certainly abused. Can those things really lead to pure lives and a clear conscience before the Lord? No. And that's Paul's whole goal. Abound in love, in knowledge and discernment, so that you can actually understand what really matters in life. Here's the whole end goal, so that you can live pure and blameless. That's Paul's heart for his church that he loves. He says, I want you to live pure and blameless lives. That's what really matters. What leads to purity? So we can, well, what really matters? Because that's kind of subjective, right? Well, let's work backwards. What leads to the end goal? What leads to purity? What leads to blamelessness? blamelessness? The word of God. Psalm 119, verse nine, how can a young man or woman keep his or her way pure? By living according to your word. What leads to purity? Obedience, faithfulness, wisdom, discernment, the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. How many of us actually during the day think about self-control? How many of us during the day actually think about exercising discernment, faithfulness, gentleness? My day is spent thinking about that list. I'll be honest with you. But those things can't actually produce purity in our lives. So the question we have to answer is, well, what does lead to purity? Everything in here. And we give maybe five or ten minutes to this on a good day, right? These things are, are what lead to purity. I love this word purity that Paul uses here. It's a Greek word, elikrines. Elikrines. One word, but it's actually two compound words. Hele and krines. Hele, the first part of that word, actually means the rays of the sun. Krino is a root word, it's a verb that means to judge. So you put those two words together, elekrines, the rays of the sun to judge, the word actually means to be judged by the sunlight. When, when it's dark in your room or outside, you can't really tell what things are, right? How many of you have like, you're, you're in your house, it's late at night, and your vacuum is against the wall, and you come into the room. <laughs> Get ready to dial 911. I think there's an intruder. And then, what do you do? You, you go, you turn on the closest light switch, and you breathe a sigh of relief. It's my vacuum in the corner of the room. Whenever it's dark, whether you're in the house or you're outside the house, it's, it's difficult to tell what things are. And so what do you do if you're searching in your bedroom for something, it's dark, you maybe take out your phone light, or you wait till the sun rises. If you're, you don't know what was outside, you wait till the sun rises the next day, you say, okay, that was a dead deer on the side of the road, whatever it might be. Okay, when something or someone is exposed by the sunlight, then you're actually able to tell what that thing is. And so, what Paul is saying is, I want your love to be guided in truth so you understand what really matters in life in order that you can live in the freedom of the light and not continue to live in this secret life of darkness. So this is Paul's whole goal. I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure, so you can be judged by the sunlight. You, you, you have nothing to hide. And the only way that that happens is when you turn from a life of sin, you come to the light, because the Bible says that when we come to Jesus Christ, that we are no longer children of the darkness, but we're children of the light, it means that you can come out in all of your sin and shame, be washed and forgiven by Jesus Christ, and now you can live freely in the light. There's nothing left to hide. There's nothing left. There's no part of me when I step into the sunlight and I'm judged by the sunlight, there's no part of me that wants to go back into the darkness because I have things to hide. 
And it is so freeing when you can just come into the light and you can step into the light and you're judged by the sunlight. All your warts and scars and you say, I'm, I'm here. And the sunlight of Jesus Christ shines on you and exposes your filth and dirt and all your sin. But the beautiful thing about the gospel is Jesus doesn't shine his light on you just to expose that you're an evil, wicked person. He brings you into the light and he cleanses you, he washes you. He doesn't bring you into the light so that everyone can just see and poke fun and see all of your dirt and see that you're a mess and see that you're a disgusting person and then pushes you back in the darkness. He says, come out into the light, but it's not until you come out and you're judged by the sunlight and you come and you're just fully exposed by the sunlight of God's holiness to then where I can wash you and I can cleanse you and I can fill, just, just wash you of your filth and then, and then continue to walk with me in the sunlight. Continue to walk in, in this beautiful freedom. You see, your mentality determines your activity. I'll say that again. Your mentality determines your activity. How you think and what you think determines what you act upon. So Paul says, I want you to understand what really matters. How you think, your mentality determines your activity. Paul says, I, it starts in the mind, I, I want you to understand what really matters so that your actions can what? You, you can be pure. It starts with the mentality. I want you to understand what really matters in life. Because if you don't understand what really matters in life, and to you, the things that matter in life are, are that list like Xbox and video games and sports and ex exercise, all that good stuff, but that's like what, that's what is like really matters to you. Okay, that mentality is gonna affect your activity. You're gonna be so obsessed and so consumed with things that don't matter. And your lifestyle is gonna reflect your understanding. Just gonna live without great purpose and without really purity. Your mentality affects your activity. Paul says, I want you to understand what really matters. The word of God, purity, Love, joy, faithfulness, devotion, loyalty, loyalty to the Lord. Because when you understand what really matters, your mentality, when you understand what really matters, that affects your activity. You're gonna be living with so much more purpose and purity and a clear conscience before the Lord. And I'm so convinced that many of us in this room are living unproductive, joyless lives because our love is misplaced. Paul says, I want your love to be overflowing in the parameters of knowledge and discernment so that you can, what? So that you can understand what really matters because your, what you love affects your brain and then, what your, then your brain affects your activity. That's what Paul says. I want your love to overflow so that you understand what really matters, so that you can then act on that, live purely and blamelessly. Many of us are living still in the darkness of our secret sins, and we don't wanna come out and be judged by the sunlight, that word for purity, because our love has been misplaced. We're, we're, we're following and pursuing so many things that might be not even necessarily bad, but just things that actually don't matter. So our minds are just consumed with things that don't matter, and then our activity follows what's in our brain. And we're not productive, we're not living pure, purely before the Lord, we're not living with a clear conscience before the Lord. We don't have joy during the day, feel constantly discouraged, feel constantly anxious, Paul's affectionate letter to his friends here he says, I'm praying for you. Pray that your love would overflow in knowledge and understanding because I want you to understand what really matters so that you can live pure and blameless lives until Christ's return. Jesus is coming again. The first time he came to die on the cross for our sin so that we could turn and repent from our sin and trust in Jesus Christ. The Bible says that Jesus is returning again for his church, for his, the Bible says his bride. We are the bride of Christ. And the people that Jesus is coming back for 
are people who live their lives in pure obedience to him. And I'll admit, you know, we're, we're all fairly young in this room. And we still think like we have our whole lives ahead of us. And for many of us, that's true. For others of us, we, we never know when that day might come. And so we assume we have the rest of our lives. And so our days are just consumed with, honestly, things that at the end of the day, when you really think about it, things that don't really matter, right? I'm guilty, totally guilty. My heart for you, just as Paul's heart was um, for this church, um, is, is the same. And I, I could honestly read through this letter, and as I was reading through this chapter, Paul's heart for this church is reflective of my heart for you guys. And I want you to truly know that. Whenever we have Bible studies together, um, every Bible study I prepare for, I'm thinking about you guys, and I, I'm thinking, in, in not a creepy or a weird way, I'm thinking very fondly of you, I love you guys, um, think about you throughout the week. I pray for you guys. Um, every Bible study I prepare for, I ask the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to say to this group? Uh, because I love them and I care about them. I could read these words to you guys, and I will, because this is my heart for you. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to God. Every time I think about you guys, I thank the Lord for you guys. Whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy. For you've been my partners in spreading the good news about Jesus Christ. I'm certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it's finally finished on the day of Christ's return. So it's right that I should feel as I do about all of you, for you have a special place in my heart. You share with me the special favor of God. Thankfully, I'm not in prison. That was the next verse. God knows how much I love you. And I long for you with tender compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer for you. I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. Lord, we thank you for the time we've been able to share together. Thank you for my friends here. And I pray that you would help us all, Lord, myself included. I pray that you would help us to understand what really matters for the whole purpose of us living pure and blameless until you come back for us. Help our love to be overflowing, Lord. Help other people to know us by our love. But may that love not be how the culture defines love. Love is love. Do whatever you feel like doing. Help our love to fall within the parameters of true biblical wisdom and understanding and discernment so that we can truly love other people with the love of Jesus. Pray for our conference this weekend. I pray that as I have done my best to set the groundwork to prepare our hearts for the weekend, I pray that now Pastor John would build on this foundation, that he would help us to learn how to live godly lives in an ungodly world. Because that's our heart, Lord. We want to live pure and blameless. It's not possible in our own strength, Lord. I don't want this message to come across like we can do this in our own strength. Lord, we can only do this by the power of your Holy Spirit living inside us. So help us, Lord, to live pure before you, to live blameless, to have a clear conscience before you, to stop hiding in our secret sins, but to come into the light for we're children of the light. We don't belong in darkness anymore. We don't belong in secrecy anymore. We belong in the light, and you are so good to receive us, Lord. 
You don't call us into the light just to expose us so that we're embarrassed or ashamed. You call us into the light so you can clean us, so you can wash us. Just whisper a prayer in your heart before the Lord right now. Just get right with him. Just confess any sin to him. Just say, Lord, I come out of the darkness and I, I come into the light, Lord. Wash me and cleanse me. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, your mercy, your compassion, your love. And I pray that we would, we would walk out of this building looking more like you, identified by our love for people, loving in truth. And again, we just commit the conference to you this weekend. I pray that it would just be a, an awesome, fun time, enjoying each other's company and fellowship. Help us to learn a ton from Pastor John from the Q&A time. Um, just bless the whole conference. We give it to you. And we thank you for what you're doing in our midst. We thank you for what you're doing here at our church. Um, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Uh, and everybody together said amen and amen.